Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. Uh, a friend of mine really likes this game, the U.S. Civil War by GMT. There's a new edition out, um, so he likes to play it. And uh, my favorite's the Victory Games, the Civil War, which is the predecessor to this. And uh, this one's growing on me. I'm digging this one. So, not really a tutorial, but we're just doing a playthrough, and I asked him if he is fine with me recording our log files. And then go back through and, and see what happened in the log file. And uh, so I think we'll just post these up for fun. Uh, you know, it's a catch for me. I, I love a good campaign game like this. But it's just, you know, to me, it's always varies on the mood, right? Sometimes I want to fight the actual battles, you know, deep, way down, low level with detail. And other times I want to enjoy the campaign nuances. So anyway... They did a really good job with this one. I didn't like the first version as much. I didn't mind it, but it's kind of hard to compete with the nostalgia of the Victory Game Civil War since that was one of the first games I figured out as a kid on my own, and I loved it because of the Civil War. I remember reading the rule book in my study hall in high school, figuring it out. So anyway, we'll get right into it. So basically, um, I'm just doing a log file here. We're, we're typing in some notes, so I'll try to get them right and read them right and uh, see what see what happens uh, and just kind of go through. I think we played two turns. We're on turn three now, so I'm going to I'm going to run through turn one and two. Turn one is short. There's only three activation phases due to the 1861 rule. I think we got the rules down pretty good, but if you notice we're doing anything wrong, please chime in because we'd like to change it up and do it. But I think we got a pretty good handle on it. But so let us know. And let's go ahead and start. So, all right. So, Chris, uh, that's his name, Chris, my buddy. He does the upgrade dice roll uh, for a uh, arsenal. He gets the 12, and that puts one in Arkansas. So, he drops one down there in Little Rock. All right. So, and let me do this for those that aren't familiar with the game. Let's go to the charts, sequence of play. So, you usually start with reinforcements, but you ignore the reinforcements on the first turn, although you do get to draw cards. You, we draw one card each. And um, we're not any of the ones with the triangles here or the arrows. Uh, those are for the advanced game. We're just going to play the basic game this time, and then we'll add rules down the road. Um, so basically in this one, you pretty much skip everything. There's no strategic movement or any of that, no leader management. And you start the action cycle. There is some. He gets to place the arsenal because that starts, and we draw cards. So anyway, so that's the sequence of play. So in this, you basically reinforce, return displaced militia or leaders, strategic movement, leader management, which is moving your leaders around. They don't move during strategic. And then you go right into the action cycle, which is similar to the victory game Civil War. Instead of rolling 2d6, you roll 1d6. And you're going to get a result of, uh, you know, if you tie, you draw more cards up to five. And then there's four of those, although not in 1861. So then he's going to place his militia. So I'm just going to, he's got some mobile, little rock. Militia are kind of interesting in this game. You just pick them up and place them for free on each of your action phases. You can move them around. They basically make a unit fight you, but they have a, a, a thing of zero, and they always have a strength of zero, and they always have to be in a uh, resource or objective. They can't just move around freely. They're, they're fairly limited. They don't have, they can't intercept, things like that. So he just placed all of those up. 1861 restrictions are uh, on. So there's all his militia. And we played the game for a while, but we were playing some things wrong, so we started over. So Chris is aware of my Anaconda plan, which was working very well. Um, but we were accidentally using action cards to move a second time in the action phase, which is not allowed. So it makes a big difference. I I think it makes the game a little more chess-like, because you have to use all your leaders, especially the North with their losers they got up North in the beginning of the war so that really makes it interesting so you'll see some of that but let's go ahead so then what we do is we call it the dice difference roll i don't know if that's what they call it in this but yeah i guess dice difference but that's what they used to call it the first one you'll probably hear me reference the first one a lot because it was my favorite of all time 
Okay, so uh, I roll a three, he rolls a four, so it's a dice difference of one, which instead of just doing one action in this game, you got to do one in each theater, Trans-Mississippi, West, and the East. And the theater is, obviously, the Trans-Mississippi is west of the Mississippi River. The uh, west is between that and this little red line here, which kind of runs down to uh, along Florida there. So... So this would all be the east on this side here. And then it kind of juts over a little bit through the mountains and then back up around West, West Virginia. All right, so it's one in each. So he decides one in the Trans-Mississippi. He takes Price. Price is, did a regroup. So this is kind of an interesting little thing you can do in this game. If you're next to any friendly strength points, you can use a leader and they can regroup and pull those strength points over to them for a uh, for one movement point. Uh, it's kind of handy. <coughs> so Price moved over there. He regroups. And then he forgot his dudes, so he moved them over there. So sometimes if you don't click on the whole stack. So basically you move down, grab Fayetteville, and he's threatening Springfield, which is still Confederate-controlled. Missouri is Union controlled, but the Confederates have a few places that have risen up. So now one in the West, he decides to train so the Confederates can spend a a dice difference and move this trade marker up. And when it hits seven, they get a free strength point, which can be very valuable. And in the East, what did he do out East? He played a card. <coughs> Excuse me, a little frog in my throat today. Also, sorry about the bright white behind me but the sun is out it's a nice sunny day I'm, a, I'm loving the sunshine and it's not too hot out so it doesn't make the air run constantly so i'm going to leave that open because it's really good and refreshing so uh so he plays a card which if you're going to as a confederates if you want to build a fort you have to play a card you do as the union too but you also get some free placements so he is going to build a fort in richmond right out of the gate which so basically it takes one activation to to upgrade or to to convert into an actual fort so he places that and that if you spend a card that doesn't use one of your dice difference that's a bonus so and you and we each started with one card so now i could i can go up here and look at hand size and he's gone so he has no cards i have one card i'm not going to probably show you guys the cards because if chris goes well it wouldn't matter but if Chris went back and watched it, so like, here's my card. I got an any card, which is really good. Any cards let you do any theater or for the union, you can do them as naval. Okay, so let's finish up. So what did he do over here? Oh, okay. So that highlighted the arsenal and just ignore me here because we haven't looked at all these things up here. So I start looking at, I started clicking on uh, display BPs and I was like, what's it doing? It's not doing anything. And Chris is like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> so just ignore that. Uh, so they're sorry, playing with buttons. All right, he's going to entrench uh, Philippi. So he places an entrenchment. Later on, we're going to switch these to the big markers. I like the board game look. It's very nice that people make stuff like this. I think it's great. Um, but I like having these big markers here. Just personal preference it's whatever you want to do because in this game you can hover over a stack and see everything so it's not a big deal okay so that's what he did for his uh so it's over the union so i got one in the trans mississippi so here comes lion he's coming to the southeast here gonna gobble up warsaw missouri i think i said mississippi and he's gonna you know park down here north northeast of springfield and uh, that's where the Battle of Wilson's Creek happened. I, um, that might actually have been right there. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. They have, uh, that was P Ridge. This is Wilson's Creek. It's kind of cool. They have some of the major battles all over the map. Uh, very nice looking map. I think we had it zoomed out when we started. Uh, it's an attractive looking map. The pieces stick out nice, but they blend, you know, they, they're relative to the, to the uh, you know, the other game had gray for the Confederates, which is maybe a preference for me, blue and the gray. But I think the brown looks great, so whatever. So we moved a uh, lion up there. We're going to railroad one in the west. So what we do is uh, just going to start moving them. 
sometimes I'll move each rail if it's short, but he went over there to McClellan. Other times we might jump to objective cities just so we don't have to move every hex one at a time. So just so you're aware of that we are watching. So he goes over to McClellan. Now the interesting thing is he cannot, McClellan couldn't activate now an attack with three because the one that moved by rail can't activate again. So there's some restrictions. So it's kind of a chess match. You got to think a little bit ahead. And I got one out east. So I'm over here. Oh, uh, what did I do? Oh, yep. I railed some. Did I rail guys? What did I do? Oh, yeah. I had guys in Annapolis. So the one thing about Vassal that um, they don't do, which is fine. I'm not, not being critical. But if you're not on the screen when it moves, it'll it'll show you where it moved to. It won't show you from where. So, But there's two dudes on Annapolis. I can't do any naval stuff on turn one, so I decided to pull them off there. All right, new dice difference. So if that's how easy the game is. You have these little, it's like three little, it's like every pulse is like a little mini game, right? I, I think that's very well done. That reminds me of the old victory games. I loved it. When you're trying to learn a game, especially as a new player, you have to have an overall strategy, but you don't have to figure out every piece's move every turn because you only get to move so much. So, all right, so here we go on to the next one. I roll a three. He rolled a three, so that means we draw cards. All right, then we roll again. So I roll a five, he rolls a three. It's a plus two to the union. So I got McClellan over here. Now this is a different activation. So now he could attack with those three if he wanted to. I'm going to do a Trans-Mississippi one first, though. So I got Lion over here. So we're going to go and we're going to gobble up Springfield and make him attack me in Springfield. And I'm going to entrench, which costs two movement points. So I went one, two, three, four. You can see on the uh, general, the first number is the attack number. Second one's the defense number if he's defending. So he's a better attacker than defender. And then the third number is his movement. Five is, is the best I think they have. That's pretty good because there's some that are threes and a lot of them that are fours. So that extra movement point is very helpful. So I'm going to dig in there in Springfield. Uh, and I think I could have converted it, but I didn't because I, I still had one movement point. But it, it won't matter. One out east. All right. So now McClellan. He attacks, but he leaves the strength point behind. And the reason I did that is I got graft in here. I don't want to just let these guys come rolling in. And I'm trying to capture. So what I want to do is this is a Confederate-controlled border state. And in this game, it's a little different than Victory Game Civil War. Victory Game Civil War, you can take over the whole state if you capture all the objectives. The objectives in this game are black. Okay? So uh, if I can capture Charleston this turn, I'll convert this whole state to Union, which means all of these little cities, the cities are always just these little white dots here, they become my my supply depots, uh, which means he has to take them over and, and work his way in a little slower. So that's my objective. I don't get any bonus victory like in the first one. You, you get more points once you capture a whole state, but this one is a little different. So, so I'm attacking with McClellan, and I play the any card it's a valuable card, but I really want to take the state. Now, I kind of biffed because I've, for some reason, got all, you know, hey, I'm taking an objective. I am not taking an objective. I'm just trying to kick, kick out these strength points here that are entrenched. So I played an any card, and I'll go look at the chart here so you can see how the combat works. So let's uh, roll it. Uh, so it's plus two to the attacker for the card. The total was two to one. So I have, and it's not a ratio thing. You're going to roll for your strength points. So if you look here, McClellan's got two strength points and the uh, rebels have one. So McClellan will roll on the two column and the rebels that have an intrinsic general, just a generic general controlling them, uh, he rolls on the one column. Uh, but he gets a plus two because he's entrenched. You can see the little entrenchment thing there. And then... Uh, I get a plus three. I get plus two for the card, and McClellan has a one for his first number, so that's an attack value of one. So I get a plus three. He gets a plus two. We always try to roll the attacker first, so in case I forget to tell you, even you can't read the name or something, it's the attacker first. So I roll first, and I get a one. Very McClellan-like. <laughs> he gets, which is a star, 
He gets a one, thankfully, which is a diamond, okay, which means I win. Now, it's not. It, uh, there's no diamond in the game, so I use the carrot symbol. Um, because if you look here, uh, uh, stars trump diamonds. So if you get a one diamond and the other guy gets a one star, he beats you. Otherwise, it's a tie, right? So it's a very easy little system, and it gives the results board a little more variety. So basically, I beat him, but nobody lost any casualties. So now he has to retreat two, so he runs that way and uh, loses an entrenchment. And then the attacker won, so he's demoralized because he's in he's not in full supply. And I won't get into supply yet, but line of... Uh, uh, limited supply, you have to be within four of a depot. So here's his depot, right? Uh, or in Covington, he's got a depot. Um, Charleston is a depot. Where if those guys, yeah, they would have been in supply. So one, two, three. You, I don't know if you have to, or one, two, you know, if you have to pay here. But anyway, um, so he has to retreat because he lost. So he's now demoralized. That only affects his... Uh, if he attacks, it doesn't give you a minus two on the defense, which would be pretty brutal in this game. Uh, I don't suffer anything, so uh, oh, I was hitting the back arrow, I think, there. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what did I do? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Confuse myself. Okay, if you're double the attacker, you can attack again. Um, so when I attacked from here, I went here and attacked him, right? And he was in supply here going over the mountains. Um, so I attacked him here. Then he retreated one, two. So that cost me one. Then I go two, three, okay? And he's got four movement point, McClellan does. So since I didn't lose and I was double him or better, I can still keep on moving. So I tried to attack him again. Sorry about that. Uh, it was two to one plus one for the Union. So if we look at the charts, uh, I won't show you the charts every time. That'll just drag it out. I rolled a one, which gave me a two, and he rolled a six. I'll show you the charts on that. You can see how mcclellan -ish he is. So I still had uh, one strength, I'm sorry, two strength points when I attacked. So McClellan was a two. He rolled a one. Right, and then he gets an extra one, so I get a diamond. And Chris over here with one strength point rolls a six and just knocked my strength point out. So that means I have to retreat to the hex I attacked from, and now I'm going to be demoralized because I lost the battle and I'm not in full supply. The only way to be in full supply, uh, and actually that's not true, I should have been in full supply. That's fine, it's learning, it didn't affect any outcome. Um, if you're within one of a railroad or for the Union, well, you think the Confederates, a controlled river, you're in full supply. You can also be within one of this port. So if there's a port here, this is in full supply, uh, and these would because of the rail, but this would still be full supply. Anything other than that, you have a four movement point depot thing. So from right here, I control this depot with this flag. So it'd be one, two, three. I could attack out. I could be here and attack, and I'd still have supply. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Um, sorry about the confusion. I was like, hey, wait a minute, what am I doing? I forgot I was still moving. So, because a lot of times that happens, and you, uh, you're you done with the combat because you got a tie or you lost, and you weren't you weren't big enough to double your opponent, right? So here I'm going to play a West card, there, and I had lost a strength point, so that kind of hurts McClellan. So he shouldn't have been demoralized, but it won't affect anything, and he is a one. So now I played a West card so I could railroad a unit. And I am going to railroad from basically out west. And I want to railroad into here to build this guy up. Okay. And now it's the Reb's turn. So it was a, a dice difference of two. So I did my two moves down the Trans Mississippi. I, I moved Lion into. Um, Springfield, I attacked with McClellan, and then I decided to burn up my card, so I have none left, and railroad a unit over here to, what's it, uh, Parkersburg, uh, so I got a little more reinforcements out west. So uh, the first 
three game turns. If you enter Kentucky, they, they go to the other side. So you won't see anybody really going into Kentucky yet. That also includes New Madrid here. You can't The Union can't move into there. So there's a lot of fighting in Missouri, West Virginia, and it'll be a little bit out east. So it's the Rebs' turn, and uh, they'll do one out west. All right, so they're moving this guy here. And uh, he meant east, so um, one out east. Then he's going to spend the other one out east to entrench Charleston. And he changes his mind, and he said, no, I want to do price. So he's going to entrench price here. So we're in a standoff. Which I don't mind. I'm happy with that. So, all right, dice difference three to four. So that means it's one action per theater. So we now remember also this first turn. There's only three action cycles in 1861. It's got a slower start. So uh, Chris has it. So he's going to do one Trans Mississippi by. He's going to train. So now he's bumped that up to two. He's trying to get to seven to get that strength point. Uh, let's see. In the west, he's going to train. So he's really bumping it up. And out east, he decides to move that guy. He's got it in. So anywhere from one to three strength points can move like they have a generic little general guy. So he's going to move up to there and take this little spot because he wants that depot so he can. So he's not out of supply at the end of his turn. Because if he's out of supply at the end of his turn, <coughs> then. He has to make a attrition roll. So, all right. All right, so in the Trans-Mississippi, I'm moving these dudes. They're just getting closer to Springfield. Out west, we're going to railroad some guys down to Cairo. We want to build up Cairo. So you can see what there. We got 15,000 men in Cairo. And then out east... I decide that uh, we'll call him General Maul, since that's my last name. <laughs> With 10,000 men, comes out of Parkersburg and attacks Charleston. So there's some militia there. So the militia still get to roll. If you look at the chart here, they have a zero column for the militia. So you still have to fight the militia. So they're nice for basically being a speed bump. So it's two to zero. So I'm rolling on the two column. Chris will be on the zero column. There's no modifiers because I have an intrinsic general and there's not a ton of modifiers. It's pretty easy. You get forts, entrenchments, rivers. Uh, um, if you're demoralized and attacking, the commander's attack rating, you play a car. There's short bombardments, so it's pretty easy. There are a couple column shifts. I think there's one left if you have a foraging marker is all. So anyway, so I roll a six. So woo! -hoo! General Maul will kill that point, and he rolls a six. So if you look at the zero, a six for the militia without any modifier, the best they can do, they can't kill anything, but they can end up with a star. So like if I had rolled a one or a two, I'd have lost. A three or four, we would have tied, and I would have retreated and been demoralized. Uh, actually, I wouldn't have been because I could have went one, two, three, and I'd be attacking in full supply with this river. But you get the point. So he died, and uh, the Union won. So we were pretty excited about that. I'm going to get rid of this for now. So then we're in the end phase. End phase, uh, control segment. So we're going to go around moving control. So Springfield, which I could have taken over right away, would have been fine. Uh, we did mix that up because I thought the uh, in the old game, uh, Missouri is neutral. So sometimes we make mistakes because I'm thinking of the old game and not the new game rules. In this game, they're union controlled already. Uh, so ended up taking off those and then putting back those Confederate uh, towns because they're still Confederate until I walk over them. Okay, and then West Virginia, that will become Union because uh, I was on Charleston. So at the end of the turn, if you have troops sitting on a hex, you could take over that hex. You can also spend a movement point to do it, but you have to have two strength points or more to do that. But I didn't have, I didn't have the move. I guess I'm. No, because I only move because you can only move three if you have a generic general. So General Maul isn't too fast. So we convert Charleston. That's going to give me a VP, and that's going to knock down a resource for him. And we were we we're just look. He took over Summersville. Gets put a marker under there, and there we go. So end of turn rally. So now the reason they like I said, and I tell people this all the time. You're playing these games. 
Don't get so wrapped up in missing a little tiny detail here and there. It rarely affects the game from what I've seen. You'll see other videos of mine where we go back and look at what the what the dice roll would have been, and it's in the same range band. So here's an instance where I shouldn't have been demoralized because of the rail, if I'm thinking that right. And it didn't matter because he didn't attack me, I didn't attack him, so we're all good. So those guys automatically rally. You can check automatically automatic victory, but I didn't lose on turn one. That'd be, I don't even know if that's possible. If it is, uh, you'd have to be pretty abysmal to lose on, lose on turn one. So <clears throat> turn two reinforcements. So this is fun. So why East Coast gets, the Eastern Theater gets six. So I'm going to put three in Washington, and I'm going to put three out there in Dover. Okay. And the reason we put where they're going is because you won't see that the the six I had in Washington is now a nine because the only stuff it shows is when you move a unit, okay? So there, and then out west, I get to put, this is every turn, I get three in Illinois, and then I can put a combination of three between Indiana and Ohio, okay? So I put three in Cairo, and then I'm going to break up Evansville and New Albany with some other guys. So I put two there, one there. So now I got, you know, some guys building up. And then I always get two in St. Louis if I control it. If you don't control it, you lose those. So very important not to do that. Now, the Union also gets a free upgrade to a fort or create a fort every turn uh, for reinforcements. So... I'll do the fort first, so I'm going to upgrade Washington. This is a kind of an interesting rule. When you are upgrading to a fort, this does not count as a fort anymore. So if he were to attack me, I have no fort there. So you want to build up your fort before you're being threatened because you can't just say, oh, well, I have a plus, I have a level one fort there right now. It's it's going up to a level two. Nope, right now I have nothing there. And then I draw my cards. And we go to the Rebs. Okay, the Rebs are a little different. They get to upgrade their resource hex. So these are the arsenals that they place. Okay, so he rolls a six, which is North Carolina. So he drops it in Charlotte. Uh, then we figure out, um, and I'll kind of show you on the uh, sequence of play here. But the Rebs go through this where they determine the number of reinforcements. And this will be based on how many cities they have, blockade runners, different uh, arsenals, all that stuff. So they add up their... Uh, uh, let's see, what do they add up? I don't know if it says on here. Oh, it doesn't say on here, so we won't worry about that. But I can tell you what it is. You add up all these uh, resource points, right? I think, what do they call them? BPs? Resource BPs. So he has 96. That's why you want to keep track of it as you play. So he gets 96. He, his arsenal, this number will always be the same as the turn number until the Union starts capturing him. So he gets two for that. So now he's at 98. Now, border state BPs. For every objective, all right, so at the beginning of the turn, he owned Springfield. And since it's a black versus a hollow city, if it's filled in or like this here, and I believe these are the same, um, he would have gotten three more resource points for that which doesn't sound like a lot, but it can be the difference between an extra guy or not, right? So I took that back, so he gets zero for that. And then you do the blockade runners, okay? Now this is kind of a fun part. Um, so these are, each one of these little numbers here is the blockade value of that port, right? And if you, these are forts, so if you're going to attack them, you have to attack them. These little things with a box, you can just, the Union can actually just move into them. They don't have to, there's, they're still assaulting it, but there's no value where this has, this has an automatic zero guy in it, right? So you go add up all these and they're on here too. So it's easy to keep track of. That's why I want to try to get some of these, but the first turn I can't. And then you roll on the chart here. And I'm not going to go through this every turn, so it'll get faster as we go, but through the first turn, oh, here's the Confederate formula. So you start with 100 resource points, but obviously you don't have all 100 because of certain objectives. So you uh, then you add resource points uh, destroyed by the Union to minus those, so you get your total, which was 96, right? Uh, then you got Arsenal, border states, plus three objective. That's only border states. He doesn't get them in Union states. Then we're going to add up the blockade runners and then maintenance, which starts at 10, so that's a minus 10, okay? So here's how the blockade runners work. They are right, 
my oh they're right here on the combat one. So in 1861, you're going to roll on this chart here. You get to add the value of your blockade runners. So in the North Atlantic, it'll be a plus five. In the South Atlantic, it's a plus seven. And in the Gulf states, it's an eight. So he's going to roll 1d6 and add that number. Well, as you can see here, it's pretty tough for him not to get 10 in 1861, which is the most he can get. Okay. So let's go see what he rolled. So North Atlantic is a plus five. He rolled a one, which is a six, which gives him an eight. So that's the worst he can get as an eight. So that just didn't work out for him. Okay. So that gave him eight. South Atlantic was a seven plus. So you can see where no matter what he rolls, it's going to be a 10. But we like he, he likes to roll it. I like to roll it just for completeness. So he got 10 for that. The Gulf gets plus eight. So no matter what he rolls, he's going to get 10. And then there's minus 10 for maintenance. So if you had all those numbers that we just talked about, the, I think it was 96 for the BRPs. The two for the Arsenal made it 98. Uh, it was like 28 for the Gulf points. Minus 10 is 116. You divide that number by 10, drop the fraction, so he gets 11 reinforcements. So he gets one less than I do at the very beginning. And then what he does, since it doesn't say where they go, is he gets one in the Trans-Mississippi, and then he divides them equally in the east and the west. But if there's an extra, an odd number, it goes out east. So it's really easy. So he's going to get one Trans-Mississippi, five in the east, five in the west. Very simple. Now, there's some other restrictions. Uh, the Confederates can only put two in each state. So they're going to have to use strategic uh, redeployment to, you know, train guys around, move by road. We'll go through that because that's later in the phase. Okay, so one in the Trans-Mississippi. So he plops him in Fayetteville. Two in Nashville. He always loves to put guys in Nashville. That's a good plan, though. Two will go into New Orleans. That's a different state, right? So he's going to he's gonna bolster up New Orleans. And he's going to put one right on Vicksburg. So pretty. Pretty, you know, stereotypical. Now there's five in the east. So one he's going to, he says, I'll put one in Staunton. Uh, one he can put right into Beauregard because it's in his state and it's a general he controls. And then we found out, hey, these guys are actually entrenched. So our little OCD kicks in and we put our entrenched markers on top. And then he said one in Wilmington. So he puts a guy down here and one in Savannah. So he's he's protecting these ports. Now, I can't go right into Charleston or Savannah with an attack unless I control these forts. But now if I come into here, these always have an intrinsic value zero like militia because they're fortresses. But these guys, so you can make interception rolls when you're moving troops. And if they make a nine or higher, they can roll right in there. It's an automatic intercept to go from the port city to the fort or fortress, I should say, or vice versa. So if you're in Fort Sumter here, and I try to land there, they can automatically go there, which would give them a one, which would be bad because I can only move one strength point on the second turn by naval. Or if he was sitting here and I came attacking this way, he could jump out of the fortress. So something to keep in mind. Anyway, so, oh, and then he put one in New Bern. He still had one left, so. Okay, so then you go to displaced units and generals. Uh, neither of us had any, so there wasn't any. Now you do strategic movement. All right, so you're allowed one road movement in each theater, and there's some restrictions on there. We're not going to go through them all, but basically you start in a theater, you end in a theater, you have to end on an objective town, fortress, stuff like that, uh, which we did which I did wrong here, but then we corrected it later, and it was kind of dumb. I should have just moved them to Springfield in the first place. I don't know why <laughs> I moved them here, because then I'd have to activate them all to get them here. But I did a Trans-Mississippi one, so I moved a guy from St. Louis to to there, I said. But, again, he couldn't go there because there's nothing there. He could have went to Waynesville, or he could go all the way to Springfield, which we'll correct later, which is what I should have did in the first place. Uh, anyway, he's just moving that. So I did one road the east from Washington to McClellan. So some guy's moving out of here down over to here. to, or I'm sorry, McDowell. I don't know why. Oh, no, no. Out east. Yep, so I moved him here. So they went to McClellan. So he's now at two. I rail, I'm railroading eight from the west. So I'm doing something a little different. As far as we could tell, this is legal. I got six dudes down here in Cairo. So 30,000 men down there. I'm going to pull these five and three from there. And they're all going to go chugga, chugga, chugga down the railroad. And they're all going to end up in Washington. 
So here they are. Boom. Lots of dudes. Look at that. 16 men and uh, 16 strength points in Washington. So now he could come up through Kentucky if he wants to, but he's only got three. And I can still do some rail movement during my turn, although you're restricted to only 12 hexes when you do it, when it's a non-strategic, when, when it's an activation. So I'm taking a little bit of a chance here. You know, I got guys out here like Charleston that I'd shift out here if I thought he was going to threaten these cities, but we'll see what he does. I took a chance and put them all in Washington. We'll see what happens. Okay, then we're going to do one railroad from the Trans-Mississippi and to Evansville. After I looked at that, I got a little like, hmm, I could have just done one from here and one from here, but it all works out the same. We ship these guys down here because I was like, well, that's kind of close. He could, he could activate. We, you know, next turn a couple of times, and that'll buy me a little bit of time. Usually, they go up and take Bowling Green and start trying to threat Louisville. Okay, so I decided I was done. Uh, then we found out that that strength point could not go here, but he could go here, which is where he should have went in the first place. So Lion ends up with the two, and the Rebs are next. So he's going to river one from Vicksburg to Osceola. So he basically uh wait how did he do that i think we did that wrong i don't think he could river there well i guess we we let him get away with one there and he did oh wait a minute oh he did where's osceola oh right here he was gonna do osceola he was moving up the river instead he decided to do a road movement to in the trans mississippi to gainesville okay so uh, yeah, so Fayetteville went to uh, Osce Oh, no, then he changed it. He said, I'm going to go to set of Gainesville and Osceola. I'm going to put them all in Osceola. So he rode it from Fayetteville to Osceola and uh, uh, rail uh, rivered up one to there. So he's good to go. And he's going to do run one road in the east. So he brings some guys in here to help in West Virginia, and we'll see what happens. And uh, then he did one rail from Staunton. So these guys right here went up into Manassas. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so then you do leader management. So this is where you start grabbing your leaders, and at the very end of that, or at any time you want, you can move up to two one- and two-star leaders. You can't do that with three-star leaders. But there's some interesting things. So there's a little bit of stuff going on here. So McDowell gets dem uh, demoted, and you promote McClellan, and he can transfer for free. So this is one of the few times you can transfer a three-star. So I'm going to transfer McClellan and get him over to Washington, D.C., or, or over to uh, Alexandria, okay? Because McDowell gets promoted or demoted, so now he's only a two-star, and we need to have some big guns over there. Uh, at least, I mean, a guy that can move more than six strength points, right? Because we're in a kind of a standoff here, and I want to start pushing. All right, then the uh, lion gets killed. Uh, here in this game, they use the historical deaths uh, and promotions and demotions. You, you, I don't know if there's an optional way to play it or not. It doesn't really bother me. I like all game mechanics for the most part. I like to see how they come up with the idea. So in the original game, you have to roll to see if they die in combat and stuff like that or get promoted and all that good gravy. That's a lot of fun, too. But uh, this one, it's all scripted for you. But there's a lot of strategy going on because of the limited amount of leaders you have with the ones that they put on the board. So there's plenty of give and take on trying to figure that out. So Lion gets killed. Curtis shows up. I guess he shot himself by accident when he was trying to clean his gun or something because he didn't even get into a battle. And uh, Halleck appears in the west, so I'm going to drop him in Cairo. And Burnside shows up, and I decide to throw him in Alexandria as well. Okay, now the Rebs. So he's going to bring Hardy and Johnson. He's just placing them up here to look around. So he always throws Johnson into Nashville, which is a good move. And Hardy he puts us down here south to kind of threaten Cairo if he decides he wants to. Because remember, he can go in there now if he wants. But then it's going to activate Kentucky onto my side because they've been invaded. That's why I stayed out of it. So 
Uh, then he's got Stuart and Longstreet. I thought this was kind of an interesting move. He decided to bring them into West Virginia. So he's going to try to get me back in West Virginia. I, I thought that was fascinating. That's why I love playing against other people because you never know what they're going to do. Okay. Uh, oh, and then he moves some generals. So he you can move up to two generals uh, anywhere to anywhere as long as they have line of communication, which is basically like being in limited supply. If I'm, I hope I'm using the right term there. Uh, so he moved a two-star polk. I think he does some uh, switching around, though. So we'll just get to the final product. He decides to uh, leave Price because he was going to put him in Osceola. He decides to leave Price there because he's got a 1-1-4, one, one, so he's got a better attack value. And instead he puts Polk there, who's got the uh, the defensive value of 1, uh, and decides to do that. So here we are on turn 2. We have up to 4 four cycles now because that's only three so i'm going to kind of go through these a little faster to keep the video a reasonable amount of time what do we add here we're at 41 minutes we'll probably end up at about 55 minutes depending on how much i yak all right so let's go ahead i roll a six uh then he accidentally hit the triple dice he's so he laughed about that that was pretty funny he rolls a six so we get cards again i was teasing him i said only one die sir so it was his uh so we rolled again i got a five you got a two so that's a dice difference of three so one in the east. Um, now, when you activate a cautious leader, which are these guys with the red threes, they're kind of chicken butt. So McClellan here has a three. So if I if I use a card, I can activate him with one card. But cards are pretty valuable in my opinion. And if you go up here, I had an east card, all right, and a west card and a naval card. I, but I'm going to save that East card because I want to use it for a die roll modifier. So I'm going to spend the two activations that he can move three. And we are going to attack. First, we're going to spend one movement point. We're going to regroup from Washington 11 strength points. So I thought this was pretty cool. So I, oh, let's see. Um, each click is removing a strength point, I assume. Okay, so if you look now, there's only five, 25,000. Man in Washington building a fortress, and I have 15. So what's that? That's going to be 75,000 men attacking Manassas Junction against 30,000 men. So I'm pretty bold right now. I'm feeling pretty good about myself with a, with a pretty big advantage. So we attack. Now he has an option to avoid, and he decided not to, which surprised me. And then I played my East card. Because that gives me a plus two on my attack roll. You can't play him in the defense, only in the attack. So we end up with 15 to 6, plus 3 to the Rebels, and plus 3 to the Union. Because he gets he's entrenched, so he gets plus 2 for that. And he has Bull Regard, which gives him a plus 1. That's why I wanted to save the card. Because I, I can use uh, three generals. So I get McClellan, but he's a 0. Because the 2 is only if he's defending. I get... Burnside, he gives me one. And then McDowell, he's only got a defensive, so I have to use the card to make it uh, plus three as well because otherwise I'm risking too much. And you'll see how this works now, right? So what did I have? I have 16, 15, or 15. So on 15, I'm rolling on this chart over here. I may use three liters, and I'm going to roll three dice. You're thinking, wow, you're going to be able to clean his clock. He's only on this column here. We each have a plus three. I need to beat him, not tie him or lose. And I roll a 10, right? So we're over here with a plus three is a 13. So I get a two star, feeling pretty good about life. And then he rolls a six with plus three. He gets a two star. So it's a tie. We each lose two. And I'm like, I put win, but the Rebs did not win. It's a tie. And since I was uh, right here, I'm not in uh, limited supply. I'm in full supply. So I don't demoralize. But I got to retreat back to the hex I came out of, which is fine. But it's like, are you kidding me? I got like a bazillion men to your men. And it just shoves me back. So those modifiers are a big deal. But I, I love it. I think it's a pretty fun game. So that was two of the dice difference. And then I'm going to naval invade. I can only do it with, normally I can do three strength points if I use a card. Um, Otherwise, each strength point costs me an activation, so I'm going to use one, and that's the most I can do in the second game turn is one strength point uh, act, 
might be an activation. So I don't know if it's per activation phase or whatever, but so I'm going to remove one of those and turn this guy into a one. And then we're going to go on down. And where does he stop? He lands over here into Port Royal, I think it is. Is it Port Royal or Port Royal? Port Royal. So these I can attack. If you see this, there's no square or anything. Uh, it doesn't have any value. It doesn't have like militia in it like these do. So I'm going to go for the uh, low hanging fruit. That's going to lower his blockade in the South Atlantic by one. So I move it to a six and I want to start messing with those die roll modifiers. All right. So the Rebs go. Oh, I'm trying to remember what he did here. Oh, he's moving his so militia. You can move for free every activation. They just have to stay in their state and they can move from objective to an objective. So I, I kind of like that. It's kind of a neat little rule and you don't have to burn points. So here he goes in the Trans-Mississippi. Polk is moving on up because he wants to invade. And then he's going to play a card out west because he wants to build a fort. And he's going to build it New Orleans. So not too excited about that. He builds that up right away so I can't land in there and do a bunch of damage. Which, if he didn't, I would be focusing on giving that a shot, because you have to. But when he put two guys in there, now Fort, there's no way I'm going to take it early. And he's going to play another card out west, so he's burning up the cards. But that's good, because he's now going to build a Fort in Memphis. So he's working on that. And we decided, so when you use this little Union card thing, if you try to stack them under here, because you don't have to put them in, you can shuffle whenever you want when you have to draw a card. So let me explain how this works. So each turn you draw two cards, and each time you tie a die on the activation roll, you get to draw a card. Well, you have a discard pile. So if you got a bunch of crappy ones, you don't have to throw them back in right away. But anytime you have to draw a card, you can decide to shuffle all the cards back in. So the problem was, is we were putting them on here, they won't stack, so you'd have to, you have to put them on here. And I was like, well, that's going to get me confusing. So we decided we'd stack them up here in this little place that isn't used for anything. It's just how the code was written, where we can't stack them inside that box, and that's fine. That way we can decide, because you have, it's an all or none when you put them in there, so we decided to move them there. All right, so we built in Memphis, and then out east. <laughs> And in any, oh no, this is, he was showing me because he accidentally looked at my Union cards because he didn't log in as a Confederate player. He logged in as Solo because he's used to doing that. Um, you, can, you can always know the hand size, <coughs> excuse me, of your opponent, but you're not allowed to know his cards. So in fairness, he said, well, here, I'll show you my cards. So I said, well, you can just tell me. But Chris like, no, 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 I'll show you. So I'm like, I wouldn't worry with Chris. He's about as honest as you get. So. He had an any and an East card. So he was just revealing them because he had looked at my cards, West and Naval. Now, truth being said, he thought I had an East card, he said. So it really didn't <laughs> hurt me. We kind of tease each other and stuff about memory and things like that. But anyway, so now he's got one left in the East. So we have the great Longstreet Stewart attack with 10,000 men attacking Charleston. Here they come. Now, he he can activate Longstreet, and Longstreet can bring Stuart with him, but if there's only uh, six or less strength points, you only get one leader. It says up top here. Zero to six, you can only use one leader. If you have seven to 12, you use these two columns, and you can use up to two leaders. And if you have 13 to or more, you can use three leaders, which I think the most you can have is 18. Um because you can't attack with multiple leaders from multiple directions. So anyway, so here he is with Longstreet to activate. And he wants to try to take Charleston away and get get some uh, more BP because we're coming up at the end of the, uh, I think we've got one more. Oh, no, this is the first action cycle. So it got pretty dicey right away. So it's two to two plus one for the Rebels. I'll just give you the results. He got a four. I got a three. It was a one to a star. So I lost a strength point. I had to retreat. Again, I should not have been demoralized because this is a uh, uh, major river and I was right next to it. But again, it's not going to affect anything. He's going to use uh, his last one to train. He like, so he's up to four now. So he's ha more than halfway to a free guy. Dice difference roll five to one. It's a four and it's in my favor. And anytime you get a four or a five, you see this little on to Richmond which means I have to do some kind of an attack in Pennsylvania 
uh, Virginia, I think Maryland, and it has to be against like a fort, a strength point, or you just can't move into like I couldn't just move into Aquia Station and go, all right, there I took over. I don't think you can do that. If, if it's an objective, it's Fredericksburg. Yeah, Fredericksburg is an objective. So if I attack that, if there was nothing there, I think that counts. But we're not going to do any of that, so it doesn't matter. So, all right, so on to Richmond. So I decided to do the first. So I got to use two because of, I said, my gosh, is boner. Cause he's such a bonehead. And um, it's McClellan, but it's what it is. So uh, I attack, and he decides to hold his ground again. I was kind of hoping he'd just run away. And it's 13 to 4, plus 3 to the Rebs, plus 1 to the Union. I do not have a card this time. I roll a 9. If I'd had a 10, I'd have won this battle. But he gets a 3, which ends up being a 6. So it was 1 star to 1 star. So we're each going to lose a strength point. And McClellan will run back to Alexandria Fort. <laughs> and it was a tie. So, and I was in, you know, full supply. So we're good. But you can see McClellan is having trouble getting out of the starting gate, which isn't exactly not historical. Uh, I move my, so he's got these guys down here threatening Ironton. So I move my militia from Jefferson City to there. That's a free move. And I do another one in the east. So I got these guys, so I do my little shifty move, and I come down here. Now, since this is my state now, if I move over a control marker, it just comes off. If it's not your state or it's an enemy state, you have to spend a moving point to convert it. So I just cut off his supply, which supply is calculated at the end of each activation. So they are in supply now, but he'll have a decision to make. Do I sit there and risk uh, you put a uh, foraging marker on him, which slows him down? And they also have to make an attrition die roll, or is he going to come back and deal with this? Now, here's the here's the small little nuance. You see there's the American number one on there. When he went and took that spot, um, since he wasn't twice my size or more, after the battle, he's done. So he couldn't convert that city, Charleston. So it's still my city until the end of this activation phase. So now he's got to decide, do I sit here and convert Charleston and then risk uh, losing a strength point, or do I go back and deal with it? So we'll see what he does. And run one railroad in the west for me. So I'm railroading these guys, and they head over to Missouri because it's starting to look a little dicey over there with Polk coming. I know it's only 10,000 men, but there ain't a lot out here. And it's interesting because the last game we played, he had attacked with, with Price up here and got annihilated, and then I killed Price, and then he had nothing. Where this game, it's turning into quite the chess match. So the replayability of this is is really cool, uh, especially because the dice difference, the initiative and all that, that changes everything up quite a bit. Okay, Rebs are next. So one in the Trans-Mississippi. So here he comes. Now, I took a chance. You know, I could have railroaded a guy from here or, you know, with my 12 movement, uh, you know, but I decided to put his, my zero militia and keep two in St. Louis, keep it a little stronger, right? So I took a chance. We'll see what happens. So it's two to zero. He rolls a one. I roll a two. And my guys lose. And with uh, militia, uh, it wasn't a strength point loss. But even if they are not uh, eliminated, they disperse. So they end up in the disbursement box over here. and They'll come back out during during my reinforcement. I think I forgot to bring them out because I said we didn't have any, and I did. So I'm going to have to put them on there. But we'll see. He spends one to convert Ironton, which means if he still holds this at the end of the turn, that's worth three resource points for him. All right, he does one out east. Longstreet decides, nope, I will come back. He wants to use Covington here as his supply base. Now he's in full supply, so if he ends up tying me in a battle, he doesn't become demoralized. And then what did he do? He moved Beauregard. So he came out of his entrenchment. Apparently he didn't like me pecking away at him like that forever. And he goes down to Fredericksburg and gets behind the river. Now he could have just went one, two, three, but he went that way and he must have decided to go to Fredericksburg. So now he's down in Fredericksburg. So he will have the uh, river defense if I decide to attack him. And that's our 15-year-old cat who started to go crazy. Uh, and I looked it up online and people say cats kind of start 
yowling when they get older. I've never had a cat do that, but there you go. So she's sitting out looking out the front door, which is right over there, and call of the wild. She's thinking she needs to go out there and interact, <laughs> but she's she's not an outdoor cat, so no, she'll stay indoors. Anyway, uh, he's moving some more militia around. He's got moving some guys in the east. So you can leave forts empty. And this is a good move by him. It keeps me from just moving on the land here. I probably should have been a little little more aggressive with that, but I did not. So we'll see if that was bad or not. So a nice difference. Four to two. So plus two to the Union. So one in the Trans-Mississippi. So I move that strength point over to Rolla because I'm like, okay, dude, you're not going to keep gobbling up these little little bonus points. You're gonna have, So this time I decide you're going to have to fight for it. And now... The dice difference of two was so crummy this time for me, so I had to use a card because I had I wanted to also do my naval. So I did a western one, and I uh, railroaded a strength point from Cairo to St. Louis because Fremont's kind of a clown too. He's only got a one for his defense. And I don't know what cards Chris has, so I'm like, well, I need a little bit more because I, if he takes St. Louis, I don't get the reinforcement for that until I capture it. And that's not going to be great, right? Because he's on the other side of this huge river. So if I train guys in, I still got to get on that side of the river. And I'm like, that would that would be a complete disaster. And then I did another naval one in the east. So we're going to go down here and get some low-hanging fruit. And uh, where did I go? Oh, I went into uh, Roanoke Island. So we moved them down uh, to the North Atlantic guy. Now he's only a plus four. So we're getting that low-hanging fruit. Uh, the Rebs go. So what did he do? Rebs did one in the Trans-Mississippi. So here comes Polk right out of Ironton coming after Rolla. Just like we thought. Two to one. He doesn't get a plus one. So he rolls and gets a one. I'm like, whoo hoo. I get a two. It's a tie, which means and there was no casualties. Again, you don't always lose casualties. Uh, we'll just show you two to one. Uh, he rolled a one. So it was a diamond. I rolled a two, which was a diamond, so it's a tie, so no casualties, but he has to retreat, and he is demoralized because he is in limited supply, not in full supply, but he has line of communication, but he did lose. All right, then one out east for Chris, and Longstreet attacks here, right? So we had the two to two. He is a plus one for the Rebels. He gets a four, I get a six, it's a tie. So he backs up, and he was not. Oh, no, I'm sorry. And we did each lose a strength point. Okay, so, and then since it's a tie, and he's in full supply, because it's from where you attack from, and he is one one hex away from this rail line uh, that is in full supply. So, so he didn't have to get demoralized. I get demoralized because I'm not next to a river like I was here, but I am within four movement points. And the cat's yelling again. Okay, dice difference of the next one. Hey, T? T? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't respond. She does it for a while, and then she'll stop. So we're going to keep going. I'd have to edit every video. Because every time I start talking on here, I ain't kidding. Every time during the video, she'll start yelling. So it must be something to do with me talking a lot. She's like, hey, let's get, I want to talk too. Let's. Let's make it a party. So I don't know what's going on. Okay, so dice difference. Two to six. It's a plus four in his favor. So he goes first. It's the last round. But I have an on to Richmond, so I have to do something. Now, I kind of like the fact that I get to do it last because four is a lot of dice difference. And uh, I, I really don't like when my opponent gets to do a bunch. So he goes with three training. So that pushes him to seven. So he gets his free strength point, which gets placed right away. And uh, we look it up. And can he put it with Polk? And I think we've decided that he could. Uh, I can't remember if we found out that really he could, but he changed his mind, decides to go with Full Regard. So he puts him down here in Fredericksburg. And then he's going to spend one more in the east to entrench Full Regard. He's really good at doing that. He never leaves his guys on a trench. So that leaves 
I was looking at my leaders because you want to see who might get promoted or who dies or whatever. And we don't use these dark black ones because that's for the uh, uh, advanced game with uh, Mabel. All right, so I'm going to do two in the east because I'm going to activate Nimrod over here. And he costs me two unless I use a card, but I don't want to use a card. I don't even think I have a card. And uh, he basically decided to leave some strength points. He left 15,000 men back there with McDowell, and he's taken Burnside and 45,000 men up here to attack Joe Johnson. Is it Johnston or Johnson? It's Johnston. I always forget him. All right, so here we go. We go one, two, three, and then he has to decide, are you going to avoid? Because if he avoids, he can run away, and it, ha it would have to be into this hex, which he can't. This hex, which I don't know if he can. I think he can because it's controlled by him. Or this one, because I'm attacking from here. So he can't go this way or this way because I'm coming from here. Um, you need a nine or better. and You can use the value of your leader if he's on the defensive. It's a plus two, so he needs a seven or better. But here's the caveat. If he tries to avoid and fails, he loses the defensive benefit of the mountain pass I'm coming through there. And he loses his entrenchment bonus. So he's giving up a plus three bonus to try to run away. He rolls a nine, so he skedaddles out of there really well. And he heads to Straussburg. He avoided. But uh, if I don't do an on to Richmond, I have to lose one dice difference and a strength point somewhere on the board. So I kind of had to do that. I didn't really want to do that. But, it, but I kind of had to because, you know, otherwise he gets free. Uh, I lose a strength point, and I lose a dice difference. So I might as well if I can't. There's times you don't want to. You're like, no, we're even up. You're going to crush me. I'm not going to do that. I'll just lose a guy and, you know, move on. So he avoided. Then I'm going to do my last guy out east for the naval. And we're going to come down there and take Hatteras Inlet. Just going to drop that North Atlantic block raider, blockade runner down to a three. And then I'm going to be a little sneaky in the Trans-Mississippi. And my guys in roll, I'll go this way. Now I ask him, do you want to... Uh, intercept and he just said no and then I went boop boop and he's like oh what was I thinking I should have intercepted you I was like I don't know I'm glad you didn't but it's not automatic and we weren't sure either if the we don't think this would affect it like the demoralization but we'd have to look up and see if you could do that but since he didn't want to I just move in there and since I since it's my state all I got to do is move over it and it goes away so I'm going to take away his little three B BRPs there and that makes us to the end phase. So control segment. All right, so now we're going to go flip stuff. Anywhere where you're sitting on that you didn't control, you automatically get it. So if he had a guy sitting here and he didn't convert it, it would automatically convert at the end of the phase. But we didn't have any of that. So we rally. Again, all these DMs that we kind of did wrong over here because of my supply up here didn't matter, didn't affect the game. And uh, so we remove all those. Okay, then we automatic victory check. Well... It doesn't look bad. It's uh, I need to be at six, and I was at uh, what am I at? I'm at four. And I, oh no, I'm sorry, because we're going into turn three, so I'm even up. I need to have you look at the turn you're on, which is the end of turn two. I need to have four, so I'm right on pace. If I'm twelve above that, so if for some reason I got sixteen victory points, which I don't know how you could do that, but let's say I could, that'd be an automatic victory for me. Or if for some reason I was at negative eight uh, in the favor of the Confederates, then I would automatically lose. So hopefully I, I don't have to worry about it till somewhere out here. So that's the automatic victory check. And that's where we decided to stop. We're in the fall of 1861. Uh, so we're going to do, when we start up again, we're going to do all our reinforcements, which is going to fill up the West here for me a little bit. And uh, it's going to be fun. I, I think it's an excellent game. If you've never tried it, uh, I'm very partial to the original by Victory Games. Uh, again, it's a nostalgic thing. You're not going to be able to compete with nostalgia. Um, there are things I like in both games uh, better than the other games. So I, I don't, it's not really one being better than the other, in my opinion. I think they're both fine games. Uh, my, I only played the first version of this once, and I didn't like it as much. For whatever reason, I don't know what they all changed. Maybe it was just my attitude. <laughs> but um, I have been really enjoying this. It's a really good chess match uh, with the activation cards and the, and the 
a small number of leaders and stuff. I really, really am enjoying it. So thanks for watching. I'll go ahead and, uh, and uh, end this video and we'll, uh, we'll continue next time with turn three when we, when Chris and I get some more time to play. So thanks for watching.